Hello, friends and family, and welcome to Sunday, September 6th edition of our boring meditation stuff. Recently, uh, there was a conversation among some friends about um, various approaches to the problem of anxiety, which is the whole reason for um, me making this set of videos for you folks uh, was to talk about anxiety and meditation and the topic came up um, about the efficacy of these different approaches and these things work for me these things don't work for me um, and I think that it is important for everyone to hold clear in their minds that meditation is no panacea. Panacea? Panacea? <laughs> <clears throat> it's funny, the first, I don't know how many dozen times I saw that word written as a child, um, I confused it with Pangea, the super, well, one of the many super continents. Um, and so now when I, when I read the word panacea, I, uh, I think about super continents. <laughs> I don't, um, I don't think about medicine. Um, this idea of a fix, this idea of a cure all, um, meditation will never be that, and it will never promise to be that. Meditation is a tool that you can keep in your suite of tools for dealing with not just anxiety, but life in general. There are many tools. Um, one tool that many people were discussing was the help of a therapist. <clears throat> and I think that this is extremely helpful. Um, a therapist has a certain connotation, I think, from the earlier time periods of therapy and psychotherapy and the very practice of therapy that it tends to be associated with um, very extreme mental states that, oh, you have to you have to have really suffered some trauma to talk to a therapist, or you have to be really crazy to talk to a therapist. <clears throat> Which, of course, is not true. Um, there is always the complication of whether or not a person can afford to see a therapist. Um, but a therapist is quite a sensible role um, to keep someone in your life engaged in and that role is essentially someone to speak to who has no actual influence or um, significance in your life as an individual they're not your friend they're not your mom they're not your grandmother they don't have any stake in your life other than to help you <clears throat> to help you work through your problems. Um, if you are sick, to help you get better. If you are having difficulties, to help you overcome them or see them differently. That's the only reason the therapist is there. Um, and this has huge advantages. <laughs> um, we all want someone to talk to, but sometimes our significant other or our best friend or our mom or our grandmother or whoever. Um, the example I gave was a stranger. Even a stranger becomes invested in you um, the moment that they start speaking to you. But a therapist tries explicitly not to do that. Um, they won't become romantically involved. They won't become your best friend um, because they want to put this objectivity um, 
that they value in their profession before anything else. Um, and I, I think that that's extremely valuable, but there, there are other approaches as well. Um, medicating on one hand, if, uh, if the difficulties we're facing, say anxiety right now, is so difficult that a doctor, a trained doctor prescribes us a medication, um, that's a, and if the medication is helping, um, then that's a perfectly useful approach. Um, similarly, not <laughs> medicating. So we have a tendency, I think, to want to solve our own problems. Sometimes that leads us to self-medicate, whether that's actually with medicine or whether that's with alcohol or some other distracting substance. Um, it, it can often uh, be disguised as socializing or um, something that we simply enjoy. Uh, but if we are going through exceptionally difficult emotional states, any self-medication at all, disguised or otherwise, is, is generally a bad idea. Um, and having gone through difficulties myself with um, substance use and even addiction, uh, I would say to anyone and everyone that if you find yourself in one of these states, difficult emotional states, particularly recurring difficult emotional states, you should abstain from these things. Um, there is no way, because you are not a perfectly rational person, to differentiate recreational use from self-medication. And if there is any reason to self-medicate, you are almost certainly doing so. Um, the most innocent variety of this, um, garden variety, if you will, would be the beer after work, right? Um, oh, let's go for a beer after work and relax. I, I think that, um, without belaboring the point, uh, Huxley does a good job of explaining exactly what this is in The Doors of Perception. So, he has very incisive perspective on this idea that it's no coincidence that every culture, almost every culture, has uh, varying but often quite heavy um, tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana use um, in different ratios, but that these are the socially acceptable drugs socially acceptable intoxicants for this process of self-medication. Um, meditation or not, actual medicine or not, therapy or not, if there is any part of your life that is weighing heavily on you, you shouldn't be taking these. Um, but, I mean, don't take it from me. <laughs> Go read it. Aldous Huxley, I suppose. Um, so this is another tool in the toolkit, really. Um, if we drink with any regularity, if we smoke with any regularity, if we're finding ourselves having difficulties, taking those out of the equation, the absence of self-medication um, can help. And then there are the things that we think of as um, perhaps not so significant. Uh, the amount of time that we spend watching TV opposed to the amount of time we spend reading books. Um, in my own experience, 
especially if I'm feeling stressed, especially if I'm feeling tired, it's often very tempting to go watch TV or watch a movie or at worst, in my case, uh, go watch YouTube <laughs> um, and be entertained by some goofy thing for 10 minutes. Um, there's a world of difference between that and my emotional response to a book. A book can still be um, tiresome, uh, books can still be relaxing, but um, there's, there's a very different kind of response uh, that I find myself having to a book than to any sort of video entertainment. Our routines. So I often think about how human beings raise babies. Every time I, I enter a household um, and there's a baby, maybe like one year old to two and a half, something like that, the baby has an incredible routine and the baby knows the routine and the routine is healthy and the routine is consistent and the routine is based on science <laughs> in many cases. So this kid goes to sleep at eight o'clock and wakes up at five or six a.m. and gets lots of sleep throughout the night. Um, their bedroom is very dark and maybe they get read a story before bed and um, the time before bed is slow. There's cuddling with their parents. There's there's this pacing to the child's life that the adults responsible for that child, parents, extended family, um, they want so much for that baby to have such a good night's sleep and to be healthy and keep growing because they can see that that person is growing. And it's easy to forget as adults that we are also growing. So we still go through one day um, of change. It may not be as drastic physically, especially change as a baby is going through, but it's still change. Our body is still constantly shifting, morphing, um, a sort of blob of meat <laughs> that we carry around with us um, is undergoing change. And so we should be as gentle with ourselves. Um, and so that can be really helpful as another tool. It's this routine. Force ourselves to go to bed at a certain time. And after a while, it's not forcing. It's just natural. Wake up at a certain time. Have breakfast at a certain time. Um, follow these routines because they're good for us like they are for a baby. <clears throat> and of course, then there's always meditation. And so meditation was called out as not really a fix. Um, and I think that that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, but uh, it seems to. It seems that people are uh, disappointed by meditation when they, they go to meditate and they're like, I gave it 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes of my life and, and all my problems aren't solved. Um, and I think that because it's, it's mysterious, especially in the West, um, I just leaned my head north, by the way, that's, that's not West. Um, there, there's this mysticism to it, and there's this kind of magical quality to it, and there's all this discussion about the higher stages of meditation. Um, and very little meaningful discussion about the beginning stages of meditation. And that's part of the reason that these videos exist. Um, I wanted to talk to friends about the beginning stages of meditation. And the beginning stages of meditation are still very useful, and especially if they're paired with these other healthy responses, healthy tools. Um, wholesome tools, 
the usual ones, right? Eat a good diet, eat lots of vegetables, get your exercise, go to sleep on time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also try reading a book instead of watching a TV show. Try giving yourself 20 minutes of just quiet time before you get into bed rather than like phone, 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 computer, computer. Okay, now let me sleep. <laughs> this is staring into a light bulb for the last 13 hours. Um, and medication and therapy and conversations with friends and family. Whatever it is that's helpful, um, meditation is just one more helpful thing. And it should not be looked to as a panacea. Um, it should not be looked to as even a way to deal with these problems, actually. You shouldn't think of meditation as a solution to anything. You're not going into meditation and saying, okay, I'm gonna fix <laughs> I'm gonna fix my anxiety. I'm gonna get rid of it. Um, that's probably not what's going to happen. And even if that does happen, it's not guaranteed to be forever. And it is important to look at meditation objectively and see through your own empirical observations, your own experience, what is it? Um, and this is a thing that you'll hear over and over if you are looking at schools of meditation, techniques of meditation, which are being honest with you. Those schools, those techniques, those teachers will always say, do not trust me. <laughs> do not trust, there's no Bible to trust. There is no priest to trust. There is no orthodoxy to trust. There is no set of rules that you can guarantee are perfect. You can only trust yourself and you can only trust your own individual experience. And in that, you are going to have to try meditation and then see what happens and then trust your own experience. Oh, meditation was like this. It doesn't matter what the scientists are writing in the articles that you read online or the white papers that you read. It doesn't matter what someone from Vox <laughs> makes a video about. That's not your experience. That's their experience or that's some research they did. Your experience is what matters. And the teachers of meaningful meditation techniques will tell you the same thing, that they can't tell you about the meditation technique. You have to see, you have to try it. You have to sit there with your eyes closed for 10 minutes and see if you can hold your attention on your breath. And if you can, good job. And if you can't, good job. <laughs> it doesn't really matter because that's not the point and you'll quickly see that. There is, of course, a paradox here in that we're always tempted to talk about the higher stages of meditation because those are the ones that are discussed. These initial boring stages of meditation, of repetitive, sit down, try to feel my breath. God, this is so boring. My legs hurt. Why am I doing this? <laughs> this is not the discussion of much meditation literature, certainly not much ancient meditation literature. And because the meditation liter literature, particularly ancient meditation literature, is geared toward lifelong practitioners, 22, 23, 24, in some cases, hours a day, practitioners of that particular technique of meditation. 
they pretty quickly move past the point of, God, I'm so bored. God, this is so boring. Why am I doing this? Um, they move past that. And then they move past the next difficulty and the next difficulty and the next difficulty. And in the grand scheme of things, there are techniques. Vipassana is one of them, which will claim that ultimately this is a path out of all suffering. That if you do this enough for long enough, probably as a monk or a nun, um, all the time, <laughs> that all suffering goes away. This is easy to misunderstand because it sounds like monks and nuns are on their way out of out of difficulties right out of sickness and out of injury and out of loss but if we think about that for a minute how does a nun sitting under a tree meditating for long hours, come entirely out of loss. Her body still decays every second. She still dies eventually. So there's something else there. And it's not a magical cure for all diseases. It's not some <laughs> special way that she becomes, you know, eternal. She doesn't become immortal. We don't have a bunch of magical immortal nuns walking around the planet. Um, there is no magic. And when, and that should be obvious, right? We all know there's no magic. And so when we think about it in those terms, it's like, oh, okay, right. There's something else there I'm not getting. I'm not getting it. A path out of all suffering what does that mean? And you can think about it. It won't do you a lot of good to think about it. It's better to experience it. Um, and the way to experience that is by practicing Vipassana. It's not so much by practicing Anapana, though you could practice Anapana for long enough, you would find out. Um, but if we pull that back to our own experience, okay, the monks and nuns, they are doing this very seriously all the time. This is their only interest is a way out of suffering. Then what does it mean for us as absolute beginners at the beginning here as a regular a lay person, right? Regular schmuck, the job at Walmart or whoever I am. If I sit down and meditate, what do I get out of it? Not a magical path out of anxiety, not a magical path out of diseases, not a magical path out of the difficulties of life in the material, right? A disease may still affect me. What meditation changes is my response to the disease. And that is what is meant by uh, this idea that it is a path out of all suffering. Um, not that there's anything magical about it. <laughs> no, there's nothing mystical about it. Um, it's simply changing your own responses. And it happens quite slowly. It takes a long time. But what's interesting about it um, is that you will find, if you try, that it begins immediately. That there is, you may need a longer period of time, right, to evaluate um, reasonably. But it does begin immediately. As soon as you start practicing, in earnest, 
anapana meditation or later on vipassana meditation you will find that the benefits that are there are there every little step of the way even in the very beginning so as a lay person <laughs> um, it it is difficult it is difficult to say oh, okay we'll completely remove ourselves from suffering right because we don't spend all day under a tree meditating but whatever stations whatever goal posts um, whatever midway marks the monks and the nuns cross on their way to the very end whatever that is we can also cross right and some of them are very concrete and they're specified <laughs> in advance this will happen and then this will happen and then this will happen and it's quite surprising how consistent they are um, and how regular <laughs> um, and in that order and everything else um, but every tiny step along the way a person finds that like oh okay yeah it's helping it's helping it's helping um, and that is what makes it worthwhile um, it's not that it's necessarily a solution to anything. You will still have to live your life. You will still have to do all your other regular things. Um, but if you find in your own experience, through your own experience, that this is worthwhile and that it does seem to be helping every step of the way, then you can gain this confidence that, oh, okay, this is worth 10 minutes, 20 minutes of my day, that this is really helping. In the same way that once, twice a week, a conversation with my therapist is really helping, or once, twice a week, it's really helpful for me to uh, call my, my parents or a close friend or something like that, um, that there's value in these, these sorts of routines. Um, and with that experience, um, I hope that some of you, uh, I'm guessing the, the folks who I actually intended this video for have given up on it by this point because I realize it's once again getting long. Um, I actually hope that if any of you do watch this video, um, that you become advocates for this idea of the segregation of these two concepts, right? Beginner meditation, expert meditation. And that the monastics and meditation teachers and whoever else, they can be over there, right? They can be the experts and they can be eliminating all suffering for themselves and um, they can be reaching these high mental states and, and whatever they do and we beginners can simply experience the benefits of the meditation we can trust the experts to teach us because they've been through the things that we've been through but we're not looking to do that we're not looking to shoot for the stars <laughs> in our meditation we're just looking to have a healthy practice that helps us live a healthier life every day that's all um, I hope that you are all managing to stay healthy I hope that you are all managing to help everyone around you to stay healthy and I uh, hope that you are having or had a good weekend I will talk to you again tomorrow, hopefully with something a little shorter. <laughs> okay, goodbye.